Good afternoon, my name is Paul Middleton. I'm a professor of New Testament studies and early Christian history at the University of Chester. And uh, although I'm not quite in my kitchen for this kitchen session, um, it's in the background and I hope you're all um, staying safe. Um, I'm teaching the Theology and Religious Studies Department and we offer several courses in Theology, Religious Studies, Theology and Religious Studies and Philosophy, Ethics and Religion. And one of the exciting things about studying Theology, Religion and uh, uh, Philosophy and Ethics is it engages so many other disciplines like, like historical studies, like political studies, uh, like looking at texts or uh, literature. Uh, and what I want to do today is to try to bring together all of those different ways of looking at theology, religious studies and, and philosophy and ethics in this talk on the uh, Christian views of the afterlife. So how did the afterlife develop? Uh, what's it for? Uh, and that's the kind of question that I want us to come back to. So if you've got thoughts on uh, what the function of the afterlife is, what the purpose of an afterlife is, or how the afterlife can help people live good lives, then uh, put them in the comments and we'll come to them at the end. But uh, feel free to comment um, as I'm going through this. So one of the things I would normally do in this kind of session is, is ask people uh, what kind of images, what themes and images come to mind when we think of the afterlife. And folk usually say things like um, angels, kind of white robes, clouds, uh, harps, and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but then I would show a, a scene of uh, Michelangelo's last uh, judgment uh, with uh, demons tearing bodies apart and pulling their skins off and maybe play something from uh, Verdi's Requiem, which talks about uh, the day of wrath and day of judgment when the world will dissolve into ashes and how tremendous and terrible it will be. And that encourages people to think about a more negative aspect of the afterlife that involves uh, themes like uh, judgment, uh, separating people, uh, heaven and hell, living a good life or a bad life, uh, judgment and, and justice. And that leads to the question, what is the afterlife for? What's its function, uh, both in uh, religion or even in secular discourse? Now, the question, uh, what happens to us after we die, is an ancient question. Human beings have been asking that and wondering about that and speculating about that uh, for, for thousands of years and uh, from some of the most primitive uh, uh, religion until, until the present day. And you might actually be familiar with some images, uh, particularly from ancient Egypt, uh, where you've got uh, the god Osiris, that's the one that looks like a dog with the big ears, and he's normally uh, sitting beside a scale, and you might remember that he's weighing a heart uh, against a feather. And the idea being that if someone has lived a good life, their heart will be lighter than a feather, uh, and if they've been bad, then it's going to be heavier, and that will determine whether they have a, a comfortable or uh, less comfortable time um, in, the, in the world to come, in the underworld. But ancient people's attitude to death and the afterlife varied uh, enormously. And some people looked forward to it. Some people feared it. But others just laughed in the, the face of death. So there's a quite a famous uh, funerary inscription on gravestones in uh, around about the 2nd century in the Roman Empire, which runs non fui, fui, non sum, non curo, which basically means I was not, I was, I am not, I care not. So kind of laughing at the face of death, having a joke uh, with death. But in the earliest uh, Christian writing that we have, that's uh, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, probably written around the year 49 or, or 50 of the first century. And he uh, writes to his, uh, his, his readers, the, the Thessalonian church, um, urging them uh, not to grieve over those who have died. He says, but we would not have you ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. So Paul draws a distinction between those who believe in an afterlife and those who don't. Uh, but as we've seen, that wasn't necessarily the, the view that all people uh, had of, of death. Now, Christianity gets most of its theology, at least in the, the early years, uh, from Judaism. And when we turn to ancient Judaism, ancient Israelite religion, we find that belief in an afterlife is not particularly well developed. In fact, in the earliest years, 
there was not really any concept of a division at death or some people going uh, to heaven and some people going to hell. Basically, everyone went to the same kind of place uh, called Sheol. And you know, it wasn't particularly uh, pleasant. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't. Just listen to, to the way it's described in the book of Job and think, well, this is a positive image, a negative image, or what images come to mind? So in Job chapter 10, he talks about what's going to happen to him after he dies. He says, before I go and I shall not return to the land of darkness and deep shadow, the land of gloom like thick darkness, like deep shadow without any order, where light is as thick as darkness. It's not exactly positive, but this is where everyone went. So it was basically that the fate of those who died was to live on in some kind of shadowy um, underworld that wasn't a punishment, it was just the fact, a fact of life. And when you believe in that kind of afterlife, it actually has an effect on the way you live today. So one of the most remarkable books of the Hebrew Bible is the book of Ecclesiastes, where the teacher is, is essentially commenting on life, and it's, it's, he's quite negative. Um, and he talks about what's in store uh, for people once they die and what they should do, therefore, uh, in this life. And he says, for the living know that they will die and the dead know nothing and they have no more reward and the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished and they have no more share in what is under the sun. Therefore, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. So it's, it's kind of this philosophy um, that, well, as my grand might have said, you're a long time deed, you're a long time dead. So what should you do in the face of that? You should make this life count. And that's what uh, this remarkable uh, book of the Hebrew Bible uh, suggests. Make this life count because afterwards, well, there's nothing really to look forward to. Uh, and so that has a, that gives us this idea that what people believe in the afterlife or the way in which people think about the afterlife might actually have some effect on the way in which people live uh, today. Now, the Jews did have an answer to the question, why do bad things happen? And basically, they believed in a kind of this worldly justice. Uh, so the ancient Israelites believed that if uh, they were good, God would reward them. And if they were bad, God would punish them. Disobedience would lead to disaster and repentance would lead to restoration. And that might be some kind of plague or famine or so on. But most often in the narratives of the Hebrew Bible, it was either winning or losing in a battle. So where the people were disobedient, uh, another uh, country would come and, uh, and beat them in, in battle. Uh, but if they repented and turned back to God, God would bless them. So it was a very much a this worldly justice. And if you operate with a this worldly justice, you don't actually really need an afterlife to sort things out. The afterlife is a kind of response uh, to uh, things going wrong uh, in this world. And what you actually see that ancient Israelite view of the world break down in the second century BC. It's, it took about 100, 200 years before uh, Jesus was born. Now, the, the Jews were under the, Seleucid, the control of the Seleucid Empire and uh, King Antiochus IV was the king. And uh, the narratives from that time suggest that he, were, he banned uh, marks of, uh, of Judaism, like uh, circumcision and food laws, and punished those who kept the law. And many Jews were martyred, many Jews were killed for keeping the, the, the law. And that meant that this idea of a this worldly justice where the good were rewarded and the bad were punished really started to break down because the most pious Jews were actually the ones that were suffering uh, sometimes terrible uh, tortures and torments because they were keeping the law. And uh, there's a famous story of uh, a mother and seven brothers uh, the, the, in the books of Maccabees, uh, the second book of Maccabees, who are keen to, to keep obeying the law and each one of them is tortured to try to force them out of, of Judaism, uh, but they stand firm. And uh, the story goes like this. Uh, the king fell into a rage and he commanded the tongue of the spokesman, the eldest brother, be cut out and they scalp him and cut off his hands and his feet while the rest of the brothers and the mothers looked on. And then the king ordered them to take him to the fire, still breathing, 
and to fry him in a pan. But the brothers and the mother encouraged one another to die nobly, saying, the Lord God is watching us and truth has compassion over us. So quite a gruesome story. Each of the seven brothers are tortured, eh, but stand firm and are martyred. But the remarkable thing about this story is you actually start to see a development of the afterlife as you read in this, uh, this remarkable chapter. And so each of the brothers has a, a speech basically saying, oh, I'm going to stand firm and I'm not going to uh, give in to your, uh, your pressures and the tortures to turn away from Judaism. And so the, the first brother says, well, you might dismiss us from this life, but we're going to be raised to an everlasting life. Um, because we have died for God's laws. So you start then to see a belief in a, a resurrection after death, a post-mortem uh, resurrection. And then when one is threatened with having his hands and feet cut off, he holds out his hands and says, well, go ahead, cut them off, because I'm going to get them back again. Uh, so it's going to be some kind of bodily resurrection, you see. Now, the Hebrew Bible doesn't really have much of a developed afterlife, but you do get snippets of, snippets of it. And in the book of Daniel, which is set in the 6th century BC in the Babylonian exile, but probably written uh, around this time in the 2nd century, uh, you get this idea of an afterlife and perhaps even a judgment. In Daniel chapter 12, it says, There shall be a time of trouble, but at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of Daniel, you start to get this idea that there's going to be some kind of judgment, some kind of separation where the, the, the good will be rewarded and the wicked will be punished, but it's not particularly developed. There's not really a sense of a developed afterlife in, in the Hebrew Bible. But when you come to early Christianity, all the ingredients are kind of there uh, for views of uh, the afterlife uh, that they can inherit from Judaism. So you get this idea of a reward and punishment, a developing idea of an afterlife, but the Christians added just a little bit of fire. And you can see quite a lot uh, of paintings of, of judgment scenes where um, you know, the, 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 the good are going up to heaven, the bad are getting tossed into what my mum used to call uh, the big bad fire. And perhaps the most uh, graphic judgment scene in the New Testament comes in the book of Revelation. And uh, that describes some kind of judgment where all the people are before the throne of God. Uh, books are opened. And if people's names are written in the book of life according to what they've done, uh, they would be rewarded. And if uh, they weren't in the book of life, if they'd been evil, uh, they would be uh, thrown in the lake of fire uh, that, that burns uh, for forever. And this then leads to the question, well, how do you decide who goes where? You know, what's the, 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 what's the basis of, of judgment in Christianity? And you actually have uh, kind of two uh, contrasting uh, views on this. At this stage, I would normally um, suggest that although belief in heaven and hell may, in a literal form, uh, not be particularly common in secular society, you actually find secular media or secular discourse using the notions of, of the afterlife. So you just need to think of kind of newspaper headlines. Uh, so when uh, Saddam Hussein, the dictator of Iraq, uh, was, uh, was hanged, uh, the, the Sun newspaper in Britain um, had its headline, its front page, uh, Saddam hanged, Iraq butcher sent to hell. Now remember, this is a secular newspaper. Um, so it's not, seems to be, it's not enough that Saddam Hussein is, is, has been uh, executed. Uh, he need, he's been so wicked, he needs more. And similarly, uh, there was a similar headline in a, a Canadian newspaper uh, when Osama bin Laden was killed in Pakistan, which read, burn in hell. Um, uh, Osama bin Laden uh, killed in uh, Pakistan. So what is all that about? Why is secular discourse using this image of the afterlife? Uh, but it, it's this idea that really wicked people um, go to hell. But that's not actually what traditional Christianity teaches. Uh, Christianity is its really not about what you do uh, in Orthodox Christianity. It's about what you believe. 
So if you believe in, in Jesus, it actually doesn't matter if you've been a, a particularly bad person because your sins will be forgiven. So there's that hymn that says, the vilest offender that truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. And that kind of runs counter to this kind of secular notion of, of heaven and hell being a reward for being good or being, being bad. It's about uh, belief. Uh, believing in Jesus is what saves people in, in Orthodox Christianity. But actually, when we turn back to the New Testament, there's a, there's a jar there because um, quite a lot of these judgments seem, seem to depend on what people do rather than what people believe. So there's a, an inbuilt tension there, which is uh, quite interesting. So very famous uh, parable of Jesus, the, the sheep and the goats, where there's a judgment scene and all the nations are before uh, the, the, the judge, which is uh, portrayed as, as Jesus. And uh, he separates the people from the sheep, from the goats. And uh, it seems to be on the basis of what people did. Uh, so those who are uh, saved, um, who are the sheep, say, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and, did, and took care of you? And he will he answer them and say, whatever you did for the least of these, my brothers, you did also for me. And similarly, those who didn't do those things seem to be quite surprised and say, well, when didn't we do this? Uh, and this is, is this idea that whatever you do for one another is what counts when it comes to judgment. And uh, the righteous go to eternal life and the wicked go to eternal punishment. So how does this affect the way we live? So what's the function? What's the purpose of the afterlife? We've already seen in Ecclesiastes that if you don't believe in a an afterlife, it really puts an emphasis on the present. And St. Paul in his letter to uh, the Corinthians uh, quotes a slogan that kind of suggests this. If the dead are not raised, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. You might as well have a good time if there's nothing else to come. Do you think that's right? Do you think belief in the afterlife or not belie believing in the afterlife means people can do what they like, perhaps uh, not tend to the needy, not tend to feed the, the hungry? Uh, can we just leave people uh, to, to their own business and just worry about yourself and having a good time? Does that belief in the afterlife actually make a difference uh, here? One of the most successful Christian aid slogans uh, that raised the most money, uh, I think it was at a time of a famine, was we believe in life before death. So turning this idea of life after death on its head to again say that, well, OK, it's OK to believe in an afterlife, but we've still got to worry about this life and to treat people kindly uh, with justice and compassion. And that was a really uh, successful campaign. So that just raises the question then, does belief in an afterlife make people act better towards their neighbours, towards people in need? Or does it not matter? Can people um, live very good lives without any kind of notion of, of the afterlife? So perhaps in the comments, you might want to reflect uh, what is the afterlife for? How might belief in an afterlife affect the way people behave? Or indeed, is belief in an afterlife helpful to live a good life? Or if you've got any other questions on some of the things we've covered, uh, why don't you uh, type those now and we can uh, dis uh, discuss that. And so thanks very much uh, for listening. Um, that's uh, trying to bring together some of the ways in which uh, theology and religious studies and philosophy and ethics can engage in, in any kind of topic. Uh, we've brought in some historical studies, uh, looking at ancient texts, the ancient Israelites, uh, early Christian texts, but also iconography in the, the Roman world and uh, in the Egyptian world. And we've asked some philosoph philosophical and ethical questions about the way in which uh, beliefs might actually lead to concrete actions and then whether uh, that is actually a useful way uh, to think about things. If people only uh, act in a particularly good way because of a belief, is that really virtuous or does it not matter at all? So if you have any questions, just uh, feel free uh, to put those uh, as comments. Uh, so we've got a question from uh, Kerry, which says, um, is it possible that a belief in afterlife may encourage someone not to live their truth? They may act in a way they think they should. That's actually a really excellent question. If people have got responses to that question, then actually 
put put that in as well. Uh, this is a good time for for discussion. Uh, so the, the the question seems to be well, even if someone perhaps uh, doesn't want to act in a particularly good way, if they're worried about um, what might happen to them afterwards, uh, it might cause them to act in in a way in which is is, is counterintuitive uh, or, or against their, their kind of beliefs. So they might want to be greedy. Uh, their nature might want to, to be greedy, but um, fear of judgment uh, might cause them uh, to be good. Perhaps actually that was the, the, the function of our afterlife, isn't it? I'd encourage people uh, to, uh, to act in that kind of way. And I suppose the question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or does it matter? You know, if, if, if someone is, is only helping me because they're frightened of uh, 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 suffering in the afterlife, well, it, it, it has the same effect uh, on me. But uh, you know, I suppose if, you're, if you want to take a virtue ethics approach uh, to that question, you would say, uh, well, actually, that's not really a virtuous act if you're only worried um, about uh, what might happen to you afterwards. afterwards. Uh, but similarly, people might be inspired by, um, by a, a positive view of, of, of a world to come and try to enact uh, that world uh, in the present. So it's a, it's a really good question. And... Um, it, it, it certainly might provoke someone to act in a way which is uh, different from the way they would normally act. I, I suppose one might ask, well, does that matter? Um, if you've got any more thoughts on that, um, you know, uh, jump jump straight in. So we've got a question from uh, uh, Tamara. Um, I personally don't think a belief in afterlife changes. Uh, sorry, I, I don't think I personally don't think a belief in afterlife changes if you live your life in a virtuous, selfless way or not. I think it all depends on the person. A lot of re religious people um, are still bad, um, and vice versa for atheists. Absolutely, and it, it seems to me that. Um, even amongst, um, well, there was actually a, a, a survey, um, I think it was actually amongst a, a Church of Scotland ministers uh, that someone did a few years ago, um, actually surveying, um, a, so this is ministers, these are people, professional religious people, um, what their views of, of heaven and hell were, and it was some very high figure, it didn't believe in a literal hell, um, which you know, is actually not that surprising I suppose it's so it's one of those it's one of those uh, beliefs that 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 maybe people might talk about but think about it in a a, a more metaphorical way I mean, I'm sure there are lots of people who do think about about it literally um but uh but but yeah so that 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 raises the question well if that uh, that belief isn't really there then perhaps that doesn't have a uh, the same kind of effect perhaps it's it's something else which causes people to act in a a good or a, or a bad way. And perhaps, uh, as we saw with the, the secular newspapers, there's still some power, even if people don't believe in it literally, there's still some power in the metaphorical um, uh, the, the metaphorical idea of uh, reward and, and punishment. So this kind of, of threat, because you know, if we think about why did these newspapers feel the need to invoke the the the, the power of hell. And um, it seems that there's justice still wasn't served. It wasn't enough for um, these two uh, uh, people to be to be killed. It, it was, you know, they had something more had to happen to kind of satisfy uh, satisfy justice. Um, Emily has said, I know of someone who claimed Mother Teresa is not a good person because she is only motivated by her desire to go to heaven. Uh, perhaps it is the deal on Turtle Vu that you should act in a good way because it is your duty with no actual desire to do so for any kind of reward, even reward of feeling uh, like a good person. Yeah, that's that's exactly, that's a great um, observation. Um, now, I suppose what's the basis for judging on whether someone is, is, is good or bad? Is it because they do good or bad actions or because um, kind of in the, the motivations for doing uh, good and bad um, actions? Um, and that's a great question, and and I guess it does depend on the kind of the philosophical, uh, ethical system uh, that you bring to that question. I mean, I suppose one might say, well, in very concrete terms, uh, somebody like Mother Teresa, 
um, did help a lot of people. It did make a lot of people's uh, lives better and eased a lot of suffering. Um, so, um, you know, you, you might want to, to kind of weigh that, uh, those, those positive goods with any uh, negative uh, views of what the, the particular uh, motivations would be. Um, so, so yeah, that's 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 a that's a, a great question. I mean, again, one might say that uh, well, what uh, manifests itself is actions, which I guess is the um, what uh, the, those early uh, New Testament texts were saying. Uh, people were being judged by um, clothing the the needy, visiting the sick, um, and uh, and and taking care of, of folk, and taking care of folk was. Was regarded as a, as a good as good works. Uh, Wiki Gummy Bears says, "I don't think the view necessarily changes, but it certainly expands. They make excuses to match their views, so they can still achieve their peace and the desired afterlife." Yeah, you're all very virtue ethics uh, at, um, at here. Um, so. I, again, I, I mean, again, I think that's exactly the kind of questions uh, that we should be should be asking. Um, I, so I wonder whether, um, to, to take the, the other view, whether does motivations really matter that much, or is it what uh, what manifests itself in, in actions? You know, if people give to charity, um, you know, two people give um, ten pounds to charity, um, the charity receives twenty pounds. Do they distinguish between the two to say, oh, this £10 is more virtuous because it's given by um, a, you know, a virtue ethicist, whereas somebody is only doing this because they're very strong kind of utilitarian um, uh, beliefs. Um, I don't think anyone, says uh, Tamara again, I don't think anyone can be a completely 100% selfless in their actions. I think it is natural human nature to feel good about helping others, but doing selfless things for a reward isn't selflessness. Yes, indeed. Um, and uh, I suppose it's that transactional nature um, that um, that we might want to look at. And um, I teach uh, courses in Roman religion, and uh, you find that, uh, that, that the ancient Romans um, had a very transactional um, view of, of, of the world. Uh, you know, so if you, if you made sacrifices to the harvest god, the harvest god would bless your crops and, and so on. Uh, and so uh, so some of my religious studies colleagues kind of examine these various ways in which uh, uh, religion, religious practices uh, function. Uh, but of course, one might say that even belief in the afterlife is, is relatively speculative and uh, perhaps it's the images that help people um, uh, at least model what good belief, what good practice and bad practice uh, might look like because these things don't just... Uh, happen in a vacuum. Um, it's more about, it says uh, Wiki Gummy Bears, it's more about the argument of real and apparent goods. Exactly, that's, uh, that's uh, well, I suppose if I'm hungry and someone feeds me, that seems to me to be real rather than apparent, but yeah, I suppose that's the, that's the, the really great question that you're all really focusing on is the, is the motivation. Um, and I suppose, um, um, one might want to say, well, actually, um, perhaps uh, it's the actual concrete actions that, that matter more, just as much um, as, as, as the concrete actions, as, the, as the, you know, the concrete actions perhaps matter more than the, the motivations. Uh, does the university go into Greek belief in the afterlife? Uh, well, since you ask and I've got a minute left, um, I teach a course in third year, uh, called Jews, Christians and Pagans, 168 BCE to 132 um, CE. And that looks at the religious, uh, political, social world um, in around the, the, the first century that from which uh, Jewish and Christian communities lived. So we look at Roman and Greek uh, concepts of the world, how they viewed society. Uh, and of course, the, the way in which people viewed society in the ancient world really was, it was a world full of gods. Uh, so this uh, kind of Greco-Roman um, idea of the way in which the world worked, which was hugely influential uh, for early Christianity uh, and for Judaism. So we are now um, out of time. So I, I really hope um, you've enjoyed um, listening, engaging, and um, perhaps even watching again uh, this kitchen talk uh, from my, um, uh, my uh, well, just outside my, my, my kitchen. Um, 
And so uh, there's some other questions on the, the screen, but I'll, I'll maybe answer those uh, personally um, once I'm finished here. Uh, but in the meantime, um, I'm locked up here at home, um, and I hope you're all uh, keeping safe um, and uh, good luck with uh, your futures and uh, whatever you decide uh, to do uh, next year. So take care. Bye now.